You're listening to The American Scald, a musicology podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The American Scald's Musicology Podcast. Before we get started, there were two things I didn't cover last episode because I felt like it was getting a little heavy on the administrative stuff that I want to cover here now. First, the schedule of these episodes. As I am a PhD student, my schedule is a lot like mountain weather. It can go from sunny alpine oasis to deadly ice storm at the drop of a hat. So I'm going to try and have these episodes come out weekly, but please do be patient with me if I can't stick perfectly to that. Secondly, For those of you who have been around, yes, I know it's not ideal for me to just re-release episodes I've done before, even if the script is totally redone. I get that it's a little disappointing to see episodes about composers you've already seen before, even if the content is different. To that I say, I hear you. But the first time I redid this series, if you remember, I actually did just drop the first six episodes all at once, then drip feed the rest of them. However, that strategy killed my analytics. I put so much effort into redoing those episodes the first time, and they got barely half the plays as the ones that were released weekly. So my hands are tied here. I still urge you to give these rewritten episodes a chance. Though of course, I'm a little bit biased. Also, you can now find these episodes on YouTube. Yes, I had some friends and colleagues recommend YouTube just to increase exposure with sexy thumbnails and title cards. So if you want, you can give this podcast a spin over on my YouTube channel under the same name. Now, before we get started with this episode's composers, I want us all to take a moment to reflect on what Norwegian means to us, or what we picture when we think of Norwegian culture. Did you perhaps picture Vikings, fiddlers, trolls, giants, gods, or perhaps even some Bunader or Lefse Posuten to Mai? Good, now take that and pitch it. We have no need for any of that yet, not at least for Norwegian music in the 18th century. Yes, you heard that right. Our first recorded Norwegian composers didn't come about until the middle of the 18th century, which in music would put us in the transitional period between the Baroque and Classical eras, with more weight in the Classical category. Now, if you aren't too familiar with music history, this is a pretty big deal. We are just now starting with Norwegian music history when Central Europe had already gone through centuries of musical progress and prowess from Joskan to Bach. So our first composer... Johan Daniel Berlin, born in 1714, is Norway's first recorded composer. I mean recorded as in he was recorded in history, not, you know, audibly recorded. Now, he wasn't born in Norway, mind you, but rather in Prussia, a trend we will see throughout many of the Nordic countries. Remember that at this point, Germany, France, and Italy had well-established music culture, practice, and pedagogy, and served as the main exporters of musicians, if you will. Because of the sheer number of them, many of the composers and keyboardists, if they didn't have the chops to get a job in the highly competitive Central European scene, would seek peripheral countries for work where they could act as big fish in smaller ponds. It's likely for this reason that Johann Daniel Berlin moved to Norway, for there were very little in the way of music there. I want to emphasize one more time just how far behind this puts Norway compared to most of Europe at this time in terms of music. If the Renaissance era, one of the first of what we would consider broadly as an era of classical music, began around 1400, then this puts Norway over 300 years behind Central Europe as far as native composers are concerned. And that isn't even considering the medieval era, of which Norway had a strong tradition of chant, and a beautiful one at that. But these don't have composers attributed to them, for chant was for God and church, and dedicated to kings. So, To put Johann Daniel Berlin into context, he's operating here at the same time as Bach. Now, our friend Johann Daniel would never achieve the same historical significance of Bach, but Johann Daniel was incredibly important for Norway specifically. Not only is he the first Norwegian composer whom we know of, but he also wrote the first Dano-Norwegian textbook on music theory and practice. We'll get into the specifics of why Norwegians are speaking in a Dano-Norwegian dialect later. So not only that, but he also established the Harmonian, which was Norway's first professional music organization, one that will come up a few times throughout the next few episodes. So suffice it to say, Johann Daniel Berlin had quite the hand in setting the foundation needed for a future Norwegian music scene. Not to mention, amongst all of this, he managed to find the time to also be an instrument maker, a carpenter, city waterworks inspector, and chief of the fire department. Definitely a seize-the-day type of guy. <laughs> 
So Johann Daniel Berlin's primary job, of course, was as a court composer in Trondheim, a Staatsmusikant. Now what does this mean? In essence, a Staatsmusikant is the person who, as an employee of the government, has the sole right to all public music played within his territory. A pretty powerful position. It was within this position that Johann Daniel Berlin made an international reputation for himself and wrote countless sinfonias, concertos, and other chamber works. Unfortunately, very few of Johann Daniel Berlin's works are extant, save for a couple sinfonias and a concerto for violin. You can think of sinfonias as progenitors to the symphony, much smaller scale and for a much more intimate setting. But the concerto is pretty similar to what we know of today, a piece of music written for a solo instrument accompanied by an orchestra. Now, the purpose of a concerto is usually to display the talent and skill of an individual soloist, or of a particular instrument, rather than a normal symphony, which has the focus on the orchestra as a whole. Now, if you take the time to listen to these works, I want you to keep something in mind. Classical music of this time relies on two major things to exist, pedagogy and the aristocracy. Pedagogy, or the system of teaching, to put it another way, is crucial to the development of classical music. And this, of course, meant that in order to teach it, you had to learn it. And learning music of such a caliber was a privilege for the wealthy few, or those talented enough to receive jobs from those who were wealthy. Simply put, the people playing the classical music of the Baroque era were other rich people who had the time and money to both play and practice the instruments with more expensive professional teachers. This means that farmers, fishermen, and craftsmen, of course, had no time for such leisure. And on a much broader scale, Norway in particular especially had no such wealth or leisure, as it was one of the poorest countries in Europe at the time, as a kingdom of Denmark. And as such, the people of Norway relied on the more accessible and familiar practice of what we now call folk music for their music making. And this, of course, becomes far more relevant in the 19th century. Now, regarding the aristocracy, Germany, Italy, France, and England were all incredibly wealthy countries with a large, active aristocratic class. To understand how art music grows throughout history, you unfortunately have to follow the money. This is one of the biggest differences between classical music and folk music, for instance. Folk music is the way it is because it's made by the working class on a set amount of readily available instruments. Art music is the way it is because it's made by and for the aristocracy, who had both the money to buy instruments and pay the musicians, but also someone who has the time for leisure and social activities which the working class had far less of. This discrepancy between Norwegian culture and the cultures of Central Europe isn't going to close anytime soon at this point, but rather it will come to define Norwegian music, especially as we move through the 19th and 20th centuries. To put it simply, while Germany, France, England, and Italy were indulging in Handel's grand operas, Corelli's elegant concertos, and Bach's divine masses in gargantuan cathedrals, Norwegians were happy fiddling away and singing hymns together on communal farms. So with these two factors in mind, compare the resources someone like Bach would have had in Weimar as a court organist with the resources Johann Daniel would have had in Norway. And the concerto serves as an excellent example of this. Bach writing for a virtuoso is much different from someone like Johann Daniel Berlin writing for a virtuoso. A virtuoso in Germany would have been much more talented than a virtuoso in Norway. And thus, the actual content of the concerto would be a little simpler for Norway compared to a German concerto. The musicians, instruments, and resources Bach had in Germany far outweigh those Johann Daniel would be working with in Norway. In other words, Johann Daniel had to make do with more humble means. Yet music was still made, and it was made well by Johann Daniel Berlin. His music is simpler, yes, but you'd be hard-pressed to find someone who isn't at least a little bit charmed by the austerity of the music. And this is a trend that continues throughout Norway's music history well into the 20th century. The music of Johann Daniel Berlin, and indeed all of Norway, was limited by its resources, and that is what contributes to its uniquely quaint character. What we will find as we push on into the 19th century is that this simplicity became more of a choice and less of a necessity, because the Norwegians would come to take this noble simplicity as it was called as a core part of their national and artistic identities. So, I'll concede. Johann Daniel Berlin was not truly Norwegian as he was born and raised in Germany and taught by other Germans. However, things do get a little bit more Norwegian when considering his son Johann Heinrich Berlin, who was born in Trondheim in 1741. Like his father, Johann Heinrich only has a few extant works, but even more interesting is the ones that have survived seem to have been co-written between the two of them, or we just don't know which one wrote them. One of the two. You can find some of his music on YouTube that's always labeled as written by both of them, but don't let the uncertainty stop you from enjoying the music. 
It's utterly fresh and delightful. So these sinfonias he wrote, along with any other works by Johan Heinrich, mark the first art music written in Norway by someone born in Norway. And so I guess that officially begins the story of true Norwegian composers if you want to be a purist about it. But Johann Heinrich wasn't nearly as prolific as his father, unfortunately. He didn't run a fire department or invent instruments, but he did do one important thing. He maintained the Harmonian that his father founded, which as we will come to find was absolutely crucial to the growth of Norway's music scene well into the 19th century. So, interestingly enough, because of the way musical eras work, Johann Daniel Berlin and Johann Heinrich Berlin were technically part of two different eras. Johann Daniel Berlin came in at the tail end of the Baroque, and Johann Heinrich came into his own at the beginning of the Classical. They were effectively working during big changes in the aesthetics of classical music as a whole. Just a brief note, classical music is the name of the genre, but the classical era lasted from roughly 1750 to the early 1800s. People on the classical music subreddit got mad at me when I once wrote it ended around the 1820s, so for the sake of my inbox, I'll just meet them halfway and say it generally ended in the first decades of the 1800s, while the first Romantic era's composers began as the classical era was ending at the same time. These eras are not cut and dry, of course, as one of my favorite ways it was put by Stephen Fry, yes, the Stephen Fry, was that it's not like you're clocking out between shifts in a factory. It's not like a bell rang and the classical era people left the factory while the romantic era people uh, entered and clocked in, but rather these eras give a broad idea of how music changed over time, while individual composers were of course doing their own thing that could diverge from those trends to varying degrees. We will talk more about what these eras mean as the series goes on. So, with Johann Daniel at the end of the Baroque and Johann Heinrich at the beginning of the classical era, these are technically our only Norwegian Baroque and classical composers respectively specifically from these two eras, and with not much else to say about them because of the lack of a written record, we find ourselves at a rather abrupt end of Norway's Baroque and Classical eras. These eras were not very productive compared to their Central European neighbors, but as we will come to find, Norway had yet to realize that it had a voice of its own, and its voice would win the hearts and imaginations of audiences all over the world in the Romantic era, Norway's golden age of music. And so friends, that wraps up this episode of the American Scalds Musicology Podcast. If you'd like to explore other work that I do, such as writing and composing, head on over to my website, theamericanscald.com, to learn more or to get in touch with me. Thank you for your support, and I hope to see you on the next episode of The American Scald, a musicology podcast. 